Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Snyder Institute for Chronic Diseases Mini Medical School Lecture Series, hosted in partnership with the Calgary Public Library. We are pleased to host a compelling presentation and discussion this evening on the topic of viruses that cause cancer. My name is Hannah Riley, and I'll be the program host for this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. There will be two parts to tonight's program. First, each of our presenters will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to audience questions. We will take a 10-minute coffee break between each speaker, and refreshments will be provided to those of you here in person. You're welcome to ask your questions at any time during the presentations using Slido. To access Slido, you can scan the QR code or type www.slido into your browser and manually enter the event code Snyder MMS into the participant field to post your question. Questions submitted to Slido will be viewable to all audience members and participants can upvote the questions they would most like to see asked. Now on to more specific housekeeping items. For those of you you who have joined us online, if you lose your internet connection and drop out, you can return to this session using the same Zoom link you used to join us now. If you experience any technical issues, such as you cannot hear or see the presenters, please email snyder at buxa.com and our team will do their best to support you. For those of you here in person, we now ask that you switch your cell phone to silent mode. If you need to use the washroom, the closest facilities are off the corridor to the left when exiting the Libin Theater. In an event of an emergency, please exit through the doors nearest to you. Once out of the lecture theater, the closest exit is the north entrance to HSC. Please note, this event will be audio recorded, and the recording will be posted on the Snyder Institute website. To begin our program, I'd like to introduce Ms. Courtney Penner, who will read tonight's land acknowledgement. Ms. Penner is the City Councillor for Ward 11 and, Calgary, and a Calgary Public Library board member. As a community-minded leader, she believes it's important to support community building initiatives. She sees Calgary Public Library as an innovative civic institution leading the way with its partnerships and programming accessible to all Calgarians. Welcome, Councillor Penner. All right, I've been told to stand as far this this to my left as possible while still being in the screen. I'm good to go. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in this partnership talk with the library. Um, as introduced, my name is Courtney Penner, City Councilor for Ward 11 and Calgary Library Board Member. It's always my pleasure to be able to bring greetings at events such as these when I get the opportunity. It helps me see the community in a new way. Uh, and it helps me start to understand some of the great work that is also happening in our city. Uh, such as what you're going to learn about tonight. My apologies that I can't stay with you. I do have children to pick up. Um, and so I hope you all enjoy the evening. Feel free to send me the Coles notes if you would like. As we gather, it is with gratitude, mutual respect, and reciprocity, and that we must acknowledge the ancestral home, culture, and oral teachings of the Treaty 7 signatories, including the Siksika, the Pagani, and the Kainai First Nation. The yet Stony Nakoda nations, consisting of the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The people of the Satana Nation, these are all signatories. We also recognize Metis people of Alberta Region 3 who call Treaty 7 their home. At the library, we celebrate stories, both fiction and nonfiction. We need all of them to make up who we are. And the stories in the community of the land that we live on are always important. In Calgary, we serve the community on Winchispa, on Gutsitsi, on Mokinstis. These describe the gathering places where the Bow and Elbow Rivers meet, that convergence of ideas. We respect all people who share, celebrate, and care for Treaty 7 territory of Southern Alberta, and we honour the original caretakers of the land who remind us of the ongoing histories that precede us. We recognise the shared responsibility going forward to help bring everyone together on this journey of truth and reconciliation. The library gives access to stories that both entertain and instruct. It is a community hub where Calgarians can come online, 
hello, and in person to learn and share ideas through resources, programming, and other services. It is also a place that can help us have a better understanding of ourselves and our neighbors. The library is excited to partner with the Snyder Institute for Chronic Diseases Coming Medicine School at the University of Calgary to offer programs like these. Thank you. So without further ado, the person you really want to hear from tonight, let me introduce them. Ms. Thalia Katsadimas will moderate tonight's session. Thalia is currently pursuing a master's degree in microbiology under the supervision of Dr. Jennifer Cor- Corcoran. Did I get that right? I did. Good. At the Snyder Institute, her work focuses on exploring ways that cancer-causing viruses evade immune detection during infection. Sneaky rascals. Thalia is also a frequent public outreach volunteer with a cra- with Cracking the Cancer Code lecture series. So now with that, please let me welcome Thalia and let you get going with the program for the evening. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support of the Mini Medical School Lecture Series. I'd also like to thank our partner, the Calgary Public Library, and our sponsors, University of Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine and AstraZeneca for their continued support of this lecture series. Finally, I want to thank the Snyder Institute members and collaborating institutes for volunteering their time and their members to present such excellent lectures. Without their support, there would be no mini medical school series. Uh, For those of you in the audience tonight, we're going to be having these two lectures with a 10-minute break in the middle. And I'd encourage you after that 10-minute break to just choose a chair that's nice and close to the front because we don't have a mic for the question series for the audience. So that will make sure that when you ask a question for the audience, from the audience, our lecturers are able to hear you properly. And now I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker of the evening and my supervisor, Dr. Jennifer Corcoran, who's an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases at the the Snyder Institute for Chronic Diseases and the Charbonneau Cancer Institute at the University of Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine. Dr. Corcoran completed her PhD in molecular virology at Dalhousie University and postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Alberta and Dalhousie University. She founded her lab in 2014 at Dalhousie, studying how individual viral genes encoded by the oncogenic virus Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus, or KSHV, how they promote cancer. Jen relocated her research group to the University of Calgary in 2018, continuing to work on KSHV using molecular virology and recombinant viral genetic approaches. Capitalizing on her expertise in recombinant virology and viral host interactions, Dr. Corcoran's lab has also studied human coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, since 2020. Welcome, Dr. Corcoran. Thanks so much. Okay. Can everyone hear me? It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Snyder Institute and the Calgary Public Library um, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is viruses that cause cancer. So that was a great introduction already, so I don't need to say much about who I am. I'd just like to uh, say that in my role here at the University of Calgary, I teach virology and I also teach about viruses and cancer um, as an associate professor. Which lab has obtained funding from these various sources that I'd like to acknowledge um, on the slide here. And my research lab is comprised of some really amazing trainees, including Thalia, who introduced me. So I always like to acknowledge the amazing people in my lab who do all the research. So we're going to talk today about viruses that cause cancer. And so that means cancer is contagious. And that's not something that anybody wants to hear. And that's not what I thought when I was growing up as a child, that we could not catch cancer. But actually, you can. Um, 15 to 20% of all cancers have an infectious etiology. The majority of these cancers are caused by viruses. And viruses are estimated to be responsible for about 1.6 million new cancer cases each year. 
There are seven human viruses that cause this approximate 15% of human cancers. And they are listed on the slide here, along with their date of, or year of discovery. So these viruses include really common viruses that you might have heard of, like Epstein-Barr virus and human papillomavirus or hepatitis C virus, and also some less common viruses that you may not have heard of, including Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus that my lab studies. So now it's time to give the first definition of this uh, mini med school lecture, which is what is a virus? So a virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. And those are big words just to mean that the virus cannot grow outside of a cell. It requires entry into a cell, one of our human cells, in order to grow and make more virus. Viruses come in all shapes and sizes, like depicted on this uh, image here, on these images. And they can have their genetic material made of DNA, which is the same as our genetic material, or RNA, which is different than our genetic material. So the human tumor viruses that I've shown here are all classified as class one carcinogens, according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and also classified as a class one carcinogen by this agency is HIV. But I've graded out on this slide um, because I'm not going to talk about HIV in this lecture today. The major reason that HIV promotes cancer is because it promotes immunosuppression but it doesn't do some of the other things that I'm going to talk about today. So we're going to put HIV aside, and I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of things that these other tumor viruses do in today's lecture. So why should we study these tumor viruses? It's really important, of course, because they cause several different types of human cancer. It's really important also because viruses allow us to study early steps involved in cancer initiation in a way that we cannot study when we look at tumors after they form. Viruses have also been really instrumental over the past in helping us identify cellular oncogenes or tumor suppressors. And so now it's time for another definition of today's lecture. So when I say the word oncogene, I mean a normal cellular gene that we encode in our body. And that cellular gene regulates growth. And it, under normal circumstances, it can be on or off. However, in cancer, oncogenes are always on and not turned off. Now, the word oncoprotein simply refers to the protein that is made by the oncogene. So the protein is the part that actually does the work. And the definition of tumor suppressor protein means this is a protein that blocks growth. So it is something that's good. So we don't, um, when we um, have tumor suppressor proteins that are mutated, that is often occurring in cancer. So these types of oncogenes or tumor suppressor uh, proteins were identified through studies of tumor viruses. The first tumor virus that was actually ever, um, ever uh, identified is not a tumor virus of humans. It's a tumor virus from chickens. And it was identified by this man on the screen here, Peyton Rouse, in 1911. And so what Rouse discovered is that these chickens were getting a really aggressive form of cancer, a lot of tumors. And he discovered that if he transferred um, the uh, fil uh, filterable agent from a sick chicken with tumors to a, a, a healthy chicken, he could transfer the cancer. And so this was the, the first description of a virus, and it was the first description of a virus associated with a cancer. And everybody at the time made fun of Peyton Rose for uh, studying chicken tumors. But in the end, this was a hugely important discovery, because what he discovered is a virus called Rouse sarcoma virus which causes rapid tumors in 100% of the chickens that are infected with it because it has captured a cellular oncogene. And so in the case of Rouse sarcoma virus, the cellular oncogene has a V in front of it for virus. In the case of the normal cellular protein or oncogene, it has a C in front of it. And in the normal case, it can be turned on and off, and that makes it deregulated 
But in the case of being captured by this virus, it's always on and it causes rapid cancer. And for this really instrumental discovery that told us not only that a virus could cause cancer, but told us how our own cellular oncogenes could be regulated or misregulated to promote cancer, um, Peyton Rouse received a Nobel Prize in 1966 for this instrumental work. So it actually turns out that if you discover a human tumor virus, you have approximately 50% or greater chance of winning a Nobel Prize. And that's because it is really difficult to actually show that a tumor virus is called, the virus is causing a tumor. So even now when we have great um, sequencing ability and we can take a tumor out of a person who has cancer, we can sequence all the genetic material of that tumor. It's still really difficult to be able to say that a virus that is that sequence is in that tumor is actually a causative agent of that tumor. And when uh, I go through the lecture today, you will hopefully by the end of that appreciate why it's so complicated to be able to make that assertion. One of the reasons it's really difficult to say that a virus is a causative agent of a tumor is because many of the viruses I've shown you on this list of tumor viruses are ubiquitous. That means many of us have had them and many of us harbor at least one of them right now in our viral, which is the, the viruses that we hang on to after infection. So for example, Epstein-Barr virus, most people, greater than 90% of us, have been infected with Epstein-Barr virus in our first 20 years of life. And many of these other viruses are also quite prevalent. But we don't all have cancer. And that's because viral tumor genesis, or the virus causing cancer, requires multiple factors. And the virus is just one of those factors that changes the cells to form a precancer lesion. And many other steps are required for that precancer lesion to form an actual tumor. So this brings me to one of the important fundamental concepts of tumor virology, which is viruses alone don't cause cancer. They, viruses always have non-infectious cofactors that promote the development of cancer. So how do viruses promote the development of cancer and why do they do that? Well, let's talk about viruses again for a second. Viruses really only have two goals. They want to get into our cells, take over the cells and make more virus particles. And they want to do that while avoiding our host immune system that is designed to limit the virus from making more virus. So when a virus gets into a cell, it actually tries to take over that cell and make it into a virus factory. So the virus gets in, it takes itself apart, and it puts its genetic or, or it uses its genetic material to make more of its component parts, kind of like the instructions on a factory assembly line. And in order to do that, the virus has to steal cellular machinery to make more of itself. It steals machinery that is involved in something called DNA replication. That's how our DNA is copied to make more DNA. Viruses steal our machinery for transcription. That's the process where our DNA becomes an RNA molecule. And viruses always steal our translation machinery. That's the process in our cells where the RNA molecule becomes protein. So viruses co-opt this in order to make more of themselves. And then they take these assembly or these component parts that um, have been made in the cell, and then they assemble new virus particles. And those virus particles are released from the infected cell, and the cell dies. And so this process cannot cause cancer because this kills the cell and dead cells cannot become a cancer. So back to our definitions again, what is cancer? So cancer is a disease when some of the body's cells grow uncontrollably and they spread to other parts of the body where we don't want them to be. Many different cellular changes are required to lead to cancer. And in the cancer biology field, these have now become um, known as the hallmarks of cancer. They were first defined in 2000 by some great cancer scientists, Robert Weinberg and Douglas Hanahan. And so just to go through this in a real general term, 
Cancer means that our cells grow in the absence of the normal signals that tell them to grow. Cancer means that our cells are ignoring signals that tell them to stop growing. And they're ignoring signals that are telling them to die because they shouldn't be growing. Cancer cells can invade other parts of the body where they're not supposed to be. And our cells don't normally do this. Right. Cancer cells also are evading our immune system or tricking our immune system. So um, the immune system cannot recognize the cancer cell. Sorry. Okay, there we are. Um, cancers also accumulate multiple changes in their DNA or their chromosomes. Um, and this is called genome instability. And this is one of the important hallmarks of cancer. Cancer cells are also different than our cells in how they rely on nutrients. So these are all hallmarks as associated with all cancers. And viruses elicit all these cancer hallmarks as well. So the end result of a viral cancer is, looks pretty much similar to um, uh, uh, a cancer caused by something else. So to put this another way, a virus will come in, turn oncogenes on or and tumor suppressors off in the same way that other types of cancer have oncogenes turned on or tumor suppressors turned off by mutations in our genetic material. And the end result of both of these situations is a cancer. So I'm going to go through just a, a little bit uh, of some of the examples of viruses that induce cancer, not all of the seven, of course. So Epstein-Barr virus is a very common virus, as I said, that most of us have. And it causes a couple types of lymphoma, some types of nasopharyngeal carcinoma in the nose, and, and some types of stomach cancer. And it was first identified in the 60s. And the reason it was identified is because a surgeon, Dennis Burkett, noticed these tumors that were happening in the face of children that seemed to have um, an epidemiology that suggested they were caused by an infection. And he teamed up with some virologists and they looked at tumors under the microscope. And this is an electron micrograph that shows that there are virus particles found inside these tumors. And this is how Epstein-Barr virus was discovered. But this was quite an, uh, an amazing discovery because actually most tumors don't have any detectable virus particles. In the case of this particular tumor, um, subsequently it was shown that only one in a hundred tumor cells have virus, but most tumor cells have no virus particles. So that's because in the context of the cancer, the virus, even though it's gone in, it's become defective. Or in other situations, the virus has gone in, but it's become latent or silent. And both of these situations then end up where the virus does not grow, and so the cell does not die. And this is what we need in order for the cancer to form, because if the virus was going to grow and kill the cell, we couldn't have a cancer. So that means the search for new tumor viruses has to look for things other than virus particles, because virus particles are not mostly the cancer. And so that's how human papillomavirus, or HPV, was discovered. It was discovered um, by Harold uh, Zurhausen because he found the DNA or genetic material of HPV inside cervical tumors. And it's shown on this, um, what's called a southern blot here on the screen. And so he was able to show in his studies many years ago that about 60% of cervical tumors had HPV. We now know that 99% of cervical cancers or more have HPV. And so HPV is a major cause of cervical cancer. It also causes some other genital cancers and some forms of oral or head and neck cancer that Dr. Matthews is gonna talk about today. And he also received the Nobel Prize for this discovery. So you're probably asking yourself, if the virus is defective, how does it cause a tumor? So that's what we're gonna talk about now. So viral cancers are actually accidents. It's not the intended consequence of the virus to cause a tumor. The virus just wants to get into the cell and make more virus. But in order to make more virus, viruses actually have to alter pathways in our cells 
that control cell growth. So they induce something called the cell cycle, which makes the cell grow, and they block signals that um, stop the cell from growing, and they block signals that the cell is um, using to try to induce cell death. So tumor viruses induce growth pathways, they block cell death pathways. And they do that because they they need the growth pathways to steal all this machinery that I told you they're going to steal. And so these are just some examples of how this happens. So normally, we have a tumor suppressor protein called RB that's blocking cell growth genes. And so when it sits in front of those cell growth genes on our DNA, the cell isn't going to grow. And when there are growth signals um, from, from within the cell to tell the cell to grow, that RB protein is released from the DNA and the cell can grow. But the virus um, dysregulates this process, and it does that by encoding an oncoprotein called E7, which comes along and degrades a tumor suppressor protein called RB. And so this turns the cell growth genes on. This event then triggers another checkpoint. So our cell isn't stupid, and there are lots of checkpoints that the cell has to try to limit um, unscheduled growth. And one of these checkpoints is P53, another tumor suppressor. So when HPV comes along and turns on growth, P53 wants to come along and stop that growth or cause the cell to die. So the virus outsmarts that as well and stops this other tumor suppressor. So these are two examples of viral oncogenes that induce growth and stop the cell from dying. So tumor viruses cause activation of growth pathways and inactivation of tumor suppressors. And these viral cancers are developing from common viruses that many of us have had. So why don't we all have cancer? Well, one reason is if the virus uses our growth pathways, but it's able to still replicate, the cell will die so that we can't have cancer. Another reason is when the virus replicates, if the immune system is alerted to the presence of the virus, the cell will die so that we don't have cancer. So these things um, prevent us from, from getting cancer from a virus infection. And the only time that we can ever develop cancer from a virus infection is when we have a situation where we have a chronic infection where the cell growth pathways are on and the cell is not dying. So that happens kind of in two flavors. One, the virus gets in, the virus becomes defective, and the genetic material of the virus is broken, and sometimes it integrates into our cellular genes. And this happens for HPV. And when HPV does this, the viral oncogenes, E6 and E7, are still made, but no virus is made. So the cell doesn't die. The cell survives. It keeps growing, and you can develop cancer. The other time this happens is when a virus like EBV gets in our cells. It gets in the cells, but it keeps its genetic material silent. And so the cell does not die, but it grows in an unrestricted manner, and you can develop cancer in this case. So viral cancers develop from chronic in infections where cell growth pathways are active, but the cell is not dying. And the virus has to hide from the immune system in order for this chronic infection to persist. So why don't we all develop cancer? Well, that's because our immune system normally keeps this in check. So most viral cancers that do develop occur in a situation where the individual is immunosuppressed. So the last virus I'm just going to mention briefly is Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus, which was discovered in 1994. And it causes a couple different types of lymphoma in a rare skin cancer um, that is made up of uh, cells of the blood vessels called Kaposi sarcoma. This cancer doesn't normally happen that often. But what these graphs show you is a huge spike of KS cancer development associated with cases of HIV immunosuppression in San Francisco in the 80s and early 90s. 
So this is a really great illustration of how this viral induced cancer spiked in association with immunosuppression. And normally this cancer was kept under control. So I've told you the rate of our exposure as people to many tumor, vi tumor viruses is fairly high. And for HPV, there are some exposure estimates like approximately 30% of people become exposed to HPV within their first, two, within the first two years of their first sexual exposure. And of us, about 70% will contract, contract HPV in our life. But most of us have a successful immune response and we clear that virus infection and we clear those cells. So we kill those cells within the first two years. Those people who do not clear the infection develop a long-term chronic infection, and it's those individuals that have the risk of developing HPV-associated cancer decades after that exposure. So a lot of work is ongoing now in research labs to try to understand what are these other cofactors, how can we identify when a virus will cause a cancer and when it won't. And we don't have all the answers to that yet. But we do have mechanisms that we can use to protect ourselves against some of these really common viruses. And one of them is a vaccine for HPV called Gardasil. It was invented by these two individuals up on the screen. And it's an extremely safe vaccine and an extremely good vaccine because it's built of virus protein, but that virus protein is built into an empty shell and it doesn't have any virus genetic material inside, but it looks exactly like virus on the outside. So it induces really pro profound um, antibody response that recognizes the virus and prevents HPV infection. So there are, uh, are ways that everybody can get uh, um, immunized against HPV, and I encourage yourself and all the young people, especially in the room, to do that. So I'd like to summarize with um, these last key points. I've told you that virus infections can increase our risk of cancer, but they don't always cause cancer. But when they do, they do this because viral oncoproteins directly affect genes or pathways in our cell um, that affect growth. So for example, viral oncoproteins inactivate cellular tumor suppressors. Viral infected um, infections can also promote genomic instability. They also can suppress or trick the immune system, and it's the immune system that plays a major role in preventing cancer in our bodies. Virus infections can also cause long-term inflammation, and this can promote cancer. So we all have a virome. That's the viruses that we have been exposed to in our lives, and some of them hang around and become chronic. And our virome is one of the environmental causes that can increase our cancer risk. However, the likelihood of uh, people exposed, let's say to H, uh, HPV, of getting cancer is not the same because that cancer risk is modified by many other factors, including our environment and our genetics. And so, of course, we're saving the questions for later, but I'd like to thank you for your attention and hopefully you have some questions for the after. All right. So thank you, Dr. Corcoran, for the wealth of information and for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we're now going to take a short coffee break. Our complimentary coffee and treats are located outside the theater on your left. And so if you can all just rejoin us in 10 minutes at approximately 7.15 and just pick a seat nice and close to the front for when you come back. Everyone, I hope you all have the chance to grab a snack and a drink. So now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Wayne Matthews, who is an otolaryngologist. <laughs> Dr. Matthews completed his MD degree at the University of Toronto and went on to complete his residency in head and neck surgery at the University of Ottawa. Following his residency, Dr. Matthews pursued advanced training in head and neck oncologic and reconstructive surgery at the University of Toronto. After 12 years in practice at Western University, where he was residency program director, 
Dr. Matthews moved to the University of Calgary in 2003. Since joining the University of Calgary, Dr. Matthews has assumed many roles in medical education and research. Some of his accomplishments include initiating UCalgary's otolaryngology head and neck surgery residency training program, becoming the first program director of the resident training program, serving as section chief of otolaryngology from 2008 to 2018, vice chair of the RCPS Auto HNS Specialty Commi Committee from 2008 to 2014, chair of the Division of Otolaryngology from 2014 to 2021, and chair of the RCPS Specialty Committee of Otolaryngology from 2014 to 2021. Dr. Matthews is currently the president of the AMA section of Auto HNS and the acting executive director of the Olson Research Initiative, a clinical effectiveness research program focused on head and neck cancer. He is also Cancer Institute here at University of Calgary. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthews. I think that's working. So good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for allowing me to be here. I'd like to thank the Schneider Institute as well as the Calgary Public Libraries and the University of Calgary. I'm going to just share my screen now. And, sorry, one second. Uh, skip that. Hmm? Sorry. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Technology is not my friend. So again, I'd like to uh, thank the University of Calgary and the Olson Research Initiative. And uh, the Olson Research Initiative is made possible by a very generous endowment of the Olson family. So today I wanted to talk about a specific viral related cancer, one that uh, in my world is an epidemic, and that is HPV related or human papilloma virus related oral pharyngeal carcinoma. So what do we mean by head and neck cancers in the first place? I'm a head and neck cancer surgeon. Cancers, head and neck cancers are generally cancers that arise in the lining or mucosa of the nose, the paranasal sinuses, the oral cavity, and the larynx, but also of the pharynx, which is the throat. And specifically today, we're talking about cancers of the oral pharynx. The oral pharynx is that back part of your mouth from the junction of your hard and soft palate down through the back third of the tongue, across in front of, uh, on top of the larynx, up the back wall, and up the soft palate. It also includes the side walls of the pharynx, which contain the tonsils that you're all familiar with. There's also tonsil tissue here at the back of the, uh, of the tongue, the lingual tonsils. So the lining of the head and neck the mucosa is generally made up of squamous mucosa, and the cancers that arise from it are squamous cell carcinomas. So I have a slide of the neck here as well. And the reason that's relevant, not only because salivary glands also get different types of cancers that we treat, but mostly in this uh, context, because cancers of the oral, or oral pharyngeal mucosa and other head and neck cancers metastasize to the cervical lymph nodes. So when we treat head and neck cancers, we're not only treating the primary cancer on the mucosa, we're treating the neck. There's another more familiar view of the oral pharynx for you. So this little bump here is one of the big taste buds that divides the oral tongue from the oral pharyngeal tongue or base of tongue. So behind that over the tongue is, is the oral pharynx. And up the uh, tonsils here and up in front of the tonsils, across the soft palate to the other side, and then here are the tonsils and the back wall of the pharynx. So when people uh, develop 
oropharyngeal cancers, as shown here. This is a very typical looking uh, fungating ulcerated mass in someone's uh, right tonsil. When they develop these cancers, they either present with symptoms related to the cancer in the throat. So they get throat pain, pain on swallowing, pain in their ear on swallowing, uh, difficulty swallowing, change in diet and weight loss. So it's symptoms from the primary cancer, or they present with enlarged lymph nodes in their neck that don't go away and get progressively larger or both. And as I said, these are squamous cell carcinomas. This is just the histology slide of a typical squamous cell carcinoma. So why do people get oropharyngeal carcinomas or head and neck carcinomas in the first place? Well, it used to be fairly straightforward. People got most mucosal, head and neck, squamous cell carcinomas from smoking, excessive drinking. So there's very well-established relationships between smoking and the amount of cigarettes smoked and increased incidence of squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck, including the oropharynx, and alcohol consumption. And in fact, the two factors are not just additive, they're synergistic, meaning um, the sum is greater than the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So smoking and drinking together are really effective at creating head and neck cancers. And now there's a new uh, kid on the block, so to speak, that Dr. Corcoran spoke about, and that's human papillomavirus. This has become quite evident in clinically over the last 15 to 20 years. So incidence of head and neck cancers. So overall, this is a graph and it, it's a logarithmic uh, scale. So on this graph, there's head and neck cancer incidence overall and incidence of laryngeal cancer, which is probably the most smoking related head and neck cancer and uh, HPV related oral pharyngeal cancer. And these are logarithmic meaning that if they were put in natural uh, numbers, they would actually not be flat lines. There was straight lines that be curved up or curved down. So what you see here is all, that although the overall neck cancer has not changed much for the last many years, that there's been this progressive decrease in smoking related cancers like cancer of the larynx because smoking cessation programs over the last 40, 40 years have been effective. But at the same time, there's been a subsequent increase in these HPV related oral pharyngeal cancers. So it sort of made up the difference. So these slides uh, just show this in a little different way. So in these uh, particular slides, um, HPV related cancers, oral pharyngeal cancers are shown on the left column here, these two graphs, and HPV unrelated cancers are the traditional squamous cell carcinomas on the right. And uh, the graphs show men and women and they're in different age categories. So just to summarize, because they're a little bit hard to read, what is shown is that HPV unrelated oral pharyngeal cancers have decreased in men and women, both, that HPV related oral pharyngeal cancers haven't changed much in women, except maybe a slight increase in women over 65, but there's been a dramatic increase in HPV related oral pharyngeal cancers in men between 40 and 65 years of age, and another increase not as dramatic in men over 65. So as I said, we're, you know, from my point of view, we're seeing an epidemic now of oral pharyngeal carcinoma. And Dr. Corkins touched, uh, more than touched on this, explored this very thoroughly, but how do people get HPV related cancers? And the bottom line is it's a sexually transmitted disease. There are about a hundred strains of HPV virus there are a handful of them that are oncogenic, that is, they can cause cancers. They cause cancers of the cervix, anus, and the oropharynx. And there are lots of studies, or a few studies that show that the incidence of acquiring HPV is related to the lifetime number of sexual partners, any sexual partners, but it's most dramatic for oral sex uh, encounters, so different partners. Uh, and, and the top line is in men and the bottom line is in women. So much more dramatic increase in, in men. And there are similar curves that actually show the relationship between the number of sexual partners and oral pharyngeal carcinoma. So I never thought as an otolaryngologist I would be treating a sexually transmitted disease. So Dr. Corcoran went into this in much better detail, talking about the oncogenesis, the cancer uh, pathway 
for HPV viruses and oropharyngeal carcinoma. I just hit the uh, highlights that, that she um, mentioned that the oncogenic strains, which are mostly HPV 16 and 18, as well as a few other, um, do become embedded in the host, the basal cells of the oropharynx. These oncogenes E6 and E7 have certain effects on cancer cell cycle promotion, but also they do shut off the RV protein and the P53 protein, which are tumor suppressors. And the one, sorry, um, area of interest there is that the can the E7 protein or oncogene actually upregulates another tumor suppressor, which is P16. And that's useful for us because all HPV related cancers have show high levels of P16 protein on their surface. So on standard pathology slides, they can stain with antigens for P16 and detect the P16 protein. And there's a high, very high, but not perfect correlation between that protein and the HPV related squamous cell carcinomas. So it's a surrogate marker for us. The other way of detecting this is through in situ hybridization, which is a much higher tech, more expensive labor consu uh, consuming uh, process for actually identifying the strain of HPV in the cancer. So that's kind of the gold standard test. This is the surrogate test. So um, why is this a big deal other than the rising incidence? Well, one of the reasons is that the prognosis in HPV-related and HPV-non-related oropharyngeal carcinomas is so dramatically different. So look at the uh, graph on the right first which is the disease-free survival. Uh, so that means people that are alive um, without evidence that had oropharyngeal cancer and are alive at different time periods without recurrence. So they're cured. And there's uh, three lines here. The top one, the black one, is people that are P16 positive, HPV positive. And they have a cure rate, if you will, of something in the order of almost 90%. At the bottom are the traditional HPV negative, P16 negative cancers, which have a disease-free survival of five years of less than 60%, so dramatically different. And in between are these cancers that stain for P16, but on um, in situ hybridization are HPV negative, and they have a sort of intermediate uh, prognosis. The other thing you see here on the left, this is overall survival. So this is measures not only people dying of their cancer, but people dying of all causes. And uh, what you see here really bigger gap in overall survival between HPV negative and HPV positive oropharyngeal cancers. And why is that? That's because people that smoke and drink excessively have all sorts of other comorbidities. So they have heart disease, lung disease, they can have liver disease, peripheral vascular disease. And so subsequently, they have a higher rate of death over time from other causes not related directly to their, their cancer. You see that especially as you move out into the longer time periods. So the um, difference in prognosis between HPV positive and HPV negative oropharyngeal cancers is great enough that it's actually changed the staging system. So the AGCC is a large committee that creates a staging system for all cancers based on the primary tumor, the regional metastasis, the lymph nodes, and distant metastasis. And every once in a while, as things change, they have to update the staging system. So the last time the staging system was updated to the eighth edition was about five years ago. And they actually had to split it. So now each uh, oropharyngeal cancer staging is staged into two different diseases, HPV negative, which is looks very much like the old staging system and HPV positive. And without going through the belaboring the details, what it means is that people with HPV positive disease are much more likely to present with large and multiple lymph nodes in their neck and not a lot of throat symptoms or very small cancers in their throat. So, Despite those bulky lymph nodes, which would normally make you a stage three or four disease, many of these people are still considered stage one or two because these lymph nodes and the cancers are so responsive to treatment. So it's actually changed the staging system. And we almost, we think of this very much as two diseases. 
So in summary, there's um, a different profile in, in patients and diff therefore different considerations in treating patients with HPV negative and HPV, HPV positive oral pharyngeal carcinomas. So HPV negative oral pharyngeal carcinomas tend to occur in older individuals in their 60s or later. They tend to be smokers. They have more aggressive disease that's refractory to the conventional treatment. They have more comorbidities. They have a worse prognosis. And they have a shorter life expectancy for all those reasons. The HPV positive patients, however, are younger with an average age in the mid 50s. They're less likely to smoke. They often present with these asymptomatic lymph nodes. They have fewer comorbidities. They have an overall better prognosis. And because of all those factors, they live much longer on, in general. So how do we treat head and neck cancers in general and oral pharyngeal cancer specifically? Well, the traditional treatment is harsh. It's a bad disease that has a harsh treatment. So there are variations, but um, the treatment could be surgery. And, and um, in the traditional case, this would mean large open operations where you have to make an incision on the face. You have to make a cut with a saw through the jaw. You have to get to the back of the mouth and make, take out a lot of tissue. There's a big hole and you have to take the lymph nodes out of the neck. There's a big hole between the mouth and the neck. So you need to get some sort of tissue from somewhere else in the body to plug the hole. And then even despite all that, it's clearly a very major operation. Despite all that, these people almost always would need radiation and sometimes even chemotherapy afterwards. And to a quite a high dose, 60 gray is a, is a high dose of radiation therapy. So in Canada, these cancers were more traditionally treated with a combination of uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So the radiation is the main treatment. The chemotherapy makes the radiation more effective, also makes it more toxic. Uh, and they would be, people would be treated to really the maximum dose you think you can get away with it, both in the short and long term. So that's 70 grays. So tough, tough treatment to get through. And because these treatments are both so tough, they have a lot of adverse treatment effects. That includes effects on speech, early effects on swallowing with both surgery and during and shortly after radiation therapy. High dose radiation kills the salivary glands so people get xerostomy or dry mouth. That leads to rampant dental caries. Um, there's scarring involved with both surgery, but especially radiation in the long term, which can release, lead to trismus. That is, you can't open your mouth very wide because the muscles that close your jaws are scarred short. There's something called osteoradionecrosis where the, your jaw will, usually the mandible will actually die because of the radiation dose, requiring another big surgery like I described in the first place, putting bone from your leg into the uh, defect in the jaw. And the thing uh, that um, concerns most people for the HPV positive patients is the late effects and especially the late effects on swallowing. So many people have this regimen of high dose radiation therapy and swallow pretty well throughout the rest of their lives. But a minority, a significant minority, have progressive dysphagia, that is trouble swallowing. The swallowing gets worse and worse and worse at five years, at 10 years, at 15 years. And as people live longer, we're seeing more of these people. Uh, so one of the things I do on the side is I work with a speech language pathologist and we do uh, swallowing assessments, which are basically what I drive a laryngoscope looking at their larynx. And the speech pathologist feeds the patient liquids and other uh, purees and soft solids. Uh, and we watch what happens when they swallow. Um, so what we're really watching for is if they swallow efficiently. So in a normal person, if you if we do this test, you won't see anything. The, the food just goes down, it's gone. Um, but in these people, if I can get this video to play, you'll see both what we call residue, that is they're not swallowing effectively at all, the food is sticking around outside their larynx and it's getting into their larynx and airway, which we call penetration and aspiration. So we put green food color in um, in all these liquids so we can see them more clearly. So there's a lot of jumping around here because people don't like this very much, especially people that have a hard time swallowing. But you can see here, it's all the larynx is swollen, it's distorted from the radiation. And there, um, you can see the green outside their larynx. You can see green dripping into their larynx here, the vocal cords are there and uh, actually getting into their trachea and they're trying to cough it out. You can see how uncomfortable that is. It kind of makes me wince every time I see that. Um, but these people are losing weight. 
for getting pneumonias and end up, some of them end up with gastrostomy tubes, so they're tube fed indefinitely. So clearly a major hit on quality of life. So again, I want to—I don't want to badmouth my colleagues that are radiation oncologists. Most people don't get this, but a significant minority do. Okay. So, to some extent, with these changes, there's been a change in treatment goals, or we're working towards a change in treatment goals. So, we have a disease that has a very uh, that doesn't have a great cure rate, and it doesn't have a great prognosis. You know, really the traditional uh, approach has been that you're going to maximize disease control. That's your goal. And you're going to do that by treating them to the highest intensity that they will tolerate. And you'll accept some side effects. But the mindset's changing a bit with these cancers because these people are likely to be cured. They are likely to live a long time. And so now it's the attitude is more that we want to minimize treatment morbidity by de-intensifying, that is backing off on treatment but doing so in a way that we can't or don't compromise that excellent cancer control rate. So we want that 55-year-old that got an HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer to be the 75-year-old who can still enjoy a full life. So there's two approaches to this. So one is surgical, so uh, and the other is modifying the radiation therapy and the chemotherapy. So one approach is to do less invasive, still not exactly non-invasive, but less invasive surgery. So for some early oropharyngeal cancers, P16 positive oropharyngeal cancers, they, these cancers can be removed through the mouth. And there's two ways of doing that. One is with a laser. So it's a microscope, there's a laser attached to it. The patient's cancer is exposed through the scope. And so this is transoral laser microsurgery. And we have this set up at the foothills and we, we do this surgery. And these are always done in conjunction with taking out the lymph nodes in the neck and neck dissection. Uh, the other way is very popular in the United States is transoral robotic surgery. So this is actually using um, a robot that has various arms uh, to expose and uh, grasp the cancer and to uh, actually cut it with a, a cautery. So it cuts and seals vessels at the same time. And as you can see, there's a lot of equipment in this patient's mouth. And th this is not the surgeon, this is an assistant. It's probably just suctioning smoke away, so, this, so people can see. The surgeon's actually sitting in a corner in something that looks like a high-tech arcade booth, looking at with goggles at a 3D picture with uh, handles that control all the arms of the robot. Um, so very cool, also extremely expensive. And that's why we don't have it in Calgary. So, um, in fact, there are no uh, surgical robots anywhere in Canada that haven't been bought through uh, philanthropic uh, donations. None of them have been bought by, by uh, provincial governments. There are limitations to transoral surgery, though. One, it's the, it has to be early stage disease, uh, both in the primary and in the neck. You have to be able to expose this. Some people just can't get all this equipment in the mouth and see the tumor. There are costs and access issues. But the biggest one for us is that despite trying to select people that we think we can do surgery on and not have to give radiation therapy afterwards, 50% of them still need radiation therapy based on the final pathology report because of adverse features that require the radiation. And so if you do this and then the person still needs 60 gray of radiation, yeah, it's, it's 10 gray less than if they have primary radiation, but have you really made that much of an advance? So we really limit the number of these that we do. Not that we wouldn't like to do more as surgeons, but we really try to select people that we think we can do surgery and not have to give radiation therapy afterwards. So the other approach, and as many pronged, is trying to de-intensify de non-surgical treatment. And that can mean avoiding chemotherapy in these patient, patients. That can mean probably more significantly reducing the dose of radiation therapy, but no one knows how much you can do to reduce that dose of radiation therapy uh, without seeing the disease control rates starting to fall off. So the magic number in my mind is about somewhere around 54 gray, because we know that if you deliver more than 54 gray to the oral pharynx, that's when you start to see all the swallowing problems. So there are many 
single institution and some multi-institution trials, looking at all sorts of different combinations of changing radiation and chemotherapy. Um, there's another method where they give chemotherapy before they give radiation therapy to make the tumor shrink and then give less radiation afterwards. Um, and then there's immunotherapy where you use uh, monoclonal antibodies directed against different parts of the cancer mechanism um, to, uh, to treat these, hopefully with fewer side effects. So those are the sort of maps, the nivolumab, the pembrolizumab, et cetera. But the thing is, these studies are all, most of them aren't randomized control trials. Well, it couldn't be randomized. Most, or most of them aren't randomized control trials. They're usually small numbers. There's, people are doing all sorts of different things. It's like hurting cats. So you can't really, at this point, say this is, this is how we're going to de-intensify treatment. So we're still looking for that uh, magic bullet, as it were. So um, I also wanted to address some of the, the questions that patients and families ask us when we diagnose them with an HPV-positive or inferior carcinoma. So the question we often get is, often from the spouse is, is this cancer transmissible? I mean, my husband's got it, am I gonna get it? And the answer is no. As, as Dr. Corcoran pointed out, the virus itself, the active virus is long gone. That happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. The cancer itself is not transmissible. The other one that actually comes up more frequently than you would think is after uh, the, the spouse asks to talk to you in the hall outside and they ask you, has my spouse cheated on me? In other words, have, did they pick up this virus recently and now they have this cancer? Um, what's going on here? And the answer is no, for the same reasons. As, as Dr. Corcoran said, 70% or more people have been exposed to these viruses by the time they're 30. Um, these, this viral exposure happened decades ago. And so it doesn't mean that anything has happened in the last 5, 10, 15 years between your spouse and someone else. And you can also turn that around. I mean, maybe the partner actually picked it up from someone else and then brought it to the person that got cancer. So you got to watch where you point your finger. And the other question is, well, should I have the HPV vaccine now? And the answer is, unfortunately, no, because the vaccine prevents HPV infection. It doesn't treat HPV-related cancers. And the, again, the virus was a long time ago. So um, just to follow on, uh, you know, this is uh, one cancer that is highly preventable. Um, so in most high-income countries, including Canada, HPV vaccination of school-aged children is supported by governments, provincial governments, national governments, in both boys and girls. So uh, in Alberta, the HPV vaccine is offered to grade five students. This began for girls in 2008 and for boys in 2014. So far, the vaccination rate is about 66% or two thirds. And I don't know why the other third aren't vaccinated, but obviously that's something we'd like to change. The current vaccine is Gardasil 9. It prevents um, nine different subtypes of HPV. And the key ones are 16 and 18, but also 31, 33, 30, 45, et cetera. They're all the oncogenic viruses. The uh, 6 and 11 don't cause cancers. They cause genital warts, which are not lethal, but are generally unwelcome. So they throw that one in as well for a bonus. And this is a highly effective vaccine, 99% efficacy. So that's almost unheard of in vaccines. It has a very high safety profile. So uh, the last um, paper I looked at, you know, they do monitor vaccine reactions very carefully. In the United States, there's been 135 million doses of Gardasil. And there's, compared to people that were unvaccinated, there's no difference in any of the uh, severe long-term consequences. So sure, you can get a sore arm, you can feel like you have a headache or cold for a day or two. But as far as these, you know, the big rare complications, there's no increase in vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people after 135 million doses. So I think you can take that one to the bank. So that's my pitch for vaccination. So if you have uh, children or grandchildren of that age group, gotta push them along to get vaccinated.
Unfortunately, we won't see the effects of this vaccine now for decades. So HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancer is definitely with us for the next 20 years or more. Thank you. Okay. No, we're still on Zoom. I have to close that. Again. Okay. Awesome. So thank you to Dr. Corcoran and Dr. Matthews for the uh, fascinating information that you have shared. So we're now going to open the floor to our question and answer period, and we're going to do our best to alternate between questions that are virtually submitted through Slido and our live audience members. So as a reminder, those of you both in the audience and on Zoom, questions can be submitted virtually through Slido by scanning the QR code that we're going to share in just a moment, or by opening slido.com and entering the event code Snyder MMS, which is Snyder Mini Medical School, MMS, into the participant field. For a live audience, just raise your hand and someone will run by with a microphone. Uh, and we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as we can uh, before the event ends around eight. So I'm going to start with one of the questions from Slido while you think of your questions in the audience. And our first question is that they thought that cancer was more likely to develop, to develop when there's inflammation and chronic inflammation doesn't necessarily come from chronic infection. So if one of our uh, panelists would like to speak to that, I think just come up here. <laughs> Hi, um, so great question. And um, unfortunately there's not a one size fits all answer for viruses and inflammation. So sometimes you can get chronic inflammation that develops after a virus infection and the virus is gone. Sometimes you can get chronic inflammation when the virus is still with you. And that depends really on the type of virus that is causing that inflammation. Um, and like I said, there's no one size fits all for that. So an example of when you can get chronic inflammation where you still have a latent or hidden virus infection in your cells is Epstein-Barr virus that I mentioned. Thanks, Jen. We'll take a question from the audience right over here. So my children were vaccinated at age 15. They're now in their 30s. Do they need a booster? I mean, to my knowledge, no, but I'll let Dr. Matthews uh, also take that. So the, um, the current guidelines are that children under 15 get two vaccines. Uh, it's not really a booster. They get two vaccines six to 12 months apart. Uh, it's kind of awkward that you, you said if age 15 because there's a break there. If you're 15 and older, then it's, it's actually three vaccines. Uh, you need that extra booster if you're over 15. Um, but there's no guidance to date that um, if you've had your two doses before you're 15 or three after 15, that you need subsequent boosters every 10, every 10 or 15 years. I think it's probably just too early to know. You'd have to see what happens to the vaccine, you know, the uh, antibody titers over time uh, in these people to see what happens. So I think it's just too early to answer that question about whether they need long-term boosters, but currently no. Okay, we'll jump to one from Slido, which is how, um, how easy is it to detect a person is harboring one of these hidden viruses and their risk factors would be increased for cancer? Uh, so you can detect viral DNA for most of the viruses that we, that I talked about in my talk. Um, if you are interested to know that you can have it. Well, I don't think there's diagnostic tests most of the time, but you could do that. But I don't think that there's a compelling reason that people should actually go and do that. Um, the reason is the likelihood of actually getting cancer if you have had one of these virus infections is really quite low. Unless you're a high risk immunosuppressed individual, there would be no compelling reason to do that. All right, an audience question from over here. Thank you. I'm curious about, can you age out of when the virus would be effective? So at how old would a person be before you wouldn't vaccinate? Okay, yeah. Um, so generally the guidelines are uh, don't really recommend the vac vaccine after age 26. 
Um, there are exceptional circumstances, like if someone was in need of suppressed, um, that might be the case. But, you know, as you said, 70% of people have been exposed by the time they're 30. Um, so it's kind of versus uh, bolted by then. Okay, from our Slido, we have two questions that are about, oh, sorry, no, I'm just going to skip this one. How much does the role of stress, like negative environments, contribute to the potential inflammation in cancer? Uh, I am sure that it would contribute to the potential interactions between viruses and cancer and inflammation um, because stress can modulate our response to many things and, and that's been well shown. Um, but I can't give you a specific example of how, you know, stress of, let's say, writing exams or if you have a stressful event in your life, how that would uh, elicit cancer. I can't give you a specific example of that. Okay, we've got a question from our audience over here. This may not be relevant at all, but you're talking about the oil phal phalangeal cancers. Uh, a lot of us had tonsillectomies, which I think are going out of fashion these days. Yeah. Is that correlated at all? Uh, well, no. Um, you can still get oil pharyngeal cancer even if you've had a tonsillectomy. There's tonsil tissue all over the oil pharynx, especially at the back of the tongue, the base of the tongue. And we even see people that have had tonsillectomies that still get these cancers in the tonsil fossa because you never remove 100% of the tonsil. So, and that, that is, so that's not been shown and it's probably not. Too. Okay, from our Slido, we have a question about, uh, does immunosuppression for autoimmune conditions lead to a higher cancer risk? So this is getting out of my area, but autoimmune conditions are typically um, um, an overactive immune response. So you have antibodies that are being made against something um, in your body and that's causing that autoimmune disorder. So there is a dysregulation of your immune response, but it's not exactly uh, immunosuppression in the same way. Um, I, I don't, I can't remember a certain example where I've seen that autoimmunity has um, been associated with viral cancers, but don't quote me on that. The, the opposite's true though. People are, that are immunosuppressed are more prone to develop cancers and they're much harder to treat. Yes. Okay, we'll take up one more question from our audience, if there are any. No. <laughs> <laughs> In the cardio. <laughs> yes, I'm curious what the frequency of uh, head and neck cancer is compared with, uh, for instance, lung cancer, bowel cancer, uh, and other more common cancers. Well, overall, it uh, depends, you know, which study you read. Head and neck cancers overall are, you know, they're in the top 10 cancers, but they're towards the bottom of that top 10. Um, you know, but lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate are the big four. All right. I think we have time for one final question from our Slido, which is, um, could either of you speak to any other cofactors in inflammation um, that could increase risk? Or is it more so just about infection only that causes these cancers? So for some viral cancers, there are well... Um, well-described cofactors. Um, so, so for EBV-associated cancers, um, particularly the Burkitt lymphoma one that I mentioned, um, there's a specific genetic mutation that is associated with um, increased development of that lymphoma in the context of EBV infection. So for some cancers, there are other genetic factors that have been well-described. For many of them, that we don't know precisely what the cofactors are, uh, other than to say that always immunosuppression is not a good situation for a virus-induced cancer. The H, from a clinician's point of view, HPV is really uh, fascinating as a uh, cancer-producing virus because there's clearly an interplay between the virus and genetics. So HPV-related cancers are very geographic. So 
uh, the most common cancer in China, you know, the most populous country in the world is nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which in um, Europeans or European descent people in North America is extremely rare. Um, Berkis lymphoma is mostly seen in sub-Sahara Africa, but it's Epstein Barr viruses everywhere. And even the Inuit uh, can develop a very rare type of salivary gland cancer um, that's related to Epstein Barr virus. So there's there's definitely some genetic interplay between the virus and, and the person's genetic background. Or an additional environmental profile. So we've hit eight o'clock. Um, so I'd like to join you in thanking our presenters, Dr. Corcoran and Dr. Matthews. I believe that we touched on our other two slide out questions and our other answers. Um, and so I'd also like to thank the Snyder Institute for Chronic Diseases, the Calgary Public Library, Buck. So AstraZeneca, the Coming School of Medicine, and each of you, our audience members, for attending tonight's mini med school. We hope that you've thoroughly enjoyed tonight's presentations, and we invite you to join us again on April 3rd for our next mini med school lecture, which is on the interplay of the microbiome with neurodiversity in children. Thank you again for joining us. Safe travels home and have a great rest of your evening.